graduate student here at Berkeley, and I know that he's interacted a lot with our research IT group in the past, and now is a data scientist at Cricket Health, who uh, is the, which is a healthcare company that works on kidney care and especially targeting chronic kidney disease. And so, Kunal, I think you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And Thank you so much for coming. Absolutely, yeah. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. Hang um, on, I gotta make you, uh, I gotta give uh, you the superpower. Hang on one yeah, sec. I've learned so many Zoom skills tonight. <laughs> I should get like some kind of continuing education credit. Uh, all right, you should have it now. Okay. So the title of my talk, um, it is all about like data science patterns for modeling big data in a healthcare setting. And so, um, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about like, who am I, why am I here? Why am I talking to you? It's going to be a little bit of a different talk than uh, the previous two talks. So it's going to be a little more technical, but I'll try to stay or steer clear of the super technical stuff and, and just focus on technologies and decisions and why we went one, like one way versus the other. Um, I'll talk about how my experience as a student researcher here at Cal uh, set the groundwork for the data science, the data engineering, the DevOps stuff that I'm doing on a daily basis. Um, and then I want to deconstruct Cricket Health's data science workflow. So data science is a, is a very big thing and there are all these different little pieces of it. Um, and one of, the, one of the big pieces is data cleaning. Um, and we've kind of had a paradigm shift at Cricket Health around what is data cleaning and how can we scope it out differently and, and think about it um, just in a very different way. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about just challenges we face, improvements we made, um, infrastructure we've developed and so on. Uh, so as you correctly stated, I'm a former graduate student from the School of Public Health. I completed my MPH in Epi and Biostats. Uh, last year, almost a year ago exactly, um, in 2019, I was here for undergrad CS in public health uh, for the prior four years before that as well. Um, and I've been a consultant researcher in epidemiology labs at Cal and UCSF um, for several years. I was a domain consultant at Research IT um, doing, while I was doing my graduate degree, specializing in you know, data engineering and cloud computing infrastructure and helping consult on utilizing Savio and all this sorts of stuff. Um, and I'm now a data scientist at, at Cricket Health. So as you mentioned, it's a specialty kidney care company um, in San Francisco, and I lead their predictive modeling efforts using really large claims data sets um, to, to do some cool stuff. And so I actually had a talk uh, like a little over a year ago, well, a year and a half ago or so, about um, one of the things I developed as a BRC consultant, um, which was this like secure HIPAA compliant um, set up for data science on, on healthcare data. Um, and I built that for uh, the lab I was working for. That kind of is what got me into research IT as a consultant. Um, I built it for a couple of UCSF labs. So it's kind of out there now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how I brought this sort of setup and started using it um, at Cricket Health. And then now the newest evolution that kind of goes beyond this and, and uh, how we analyze huge healthcare data in a HIPAA compliant way um, in the next coming couple of months or so. It's six o'clock. Um, so that's just a quick architecture diagram. If you're, if you're interested, if you're ever looking back at this, um, at this, you know, at this presentation, it's essentially a server that's isolated in an Amazon virtual private cloud you VPN into, into, Berkeley, um, into Berkeley's network, uh, and that gives you access to a workspace um, that is just far smoother and easier to use than some of the comparable things I've seen from like Optum um, and their data warehouse and, and Anthem. And they they kind of give you these VMware machines and stuff. And so uh, just something that I built a while ago. And so in this talk, I wanted to start to deconstruct like the science part of, of data science um, into a few really key segments and, and talk through how I sort of tackled these segments at Cricket. So how does big data flow into a machine learning project, the ingest, the storage, the cleaning, what kinds of technologies are used there? Um, and then these new and interesting ideas of outcome engineering 
and feature engineering, the kind of counterpart, um, and then model training and how can we leverage technology um, to do those in fast and efficient ways and HIPAA compliant ways, because sometimes we just exceed the scale of what's possible on our own computers. And so uh, just to outline what happens at Cricket Health. So we ingest data, which is mostly claims. There's some EHR, um, but we ingest that data from our payer partners to S3. They typically have SFTP servers. Um, we pull the data in and we load it up to S3, which is our data lake. And in the future, one of the questions that I want to you know, think about and continue to push towards is this idea of fire or fast interoperability of health resources. It's something that's uh, been around for a while, but is only just starting to get in, like a little more steam. Um, and so I'm excited to see if there's any way to enable this sort of API um, between our company, which is a very small company, and you know, a very big insurance company that, that um, works with all sorts of different partners and leverages uh, or you know, supplies its data to other companies for them to leverage for all sorts of purposes. So after we ingest the data, we then load these raw landing data sets. They're all, they're usually full of null values. They're, they're very unclean. And they're, you know, most often surprising to me was between one insurance payer and another insurance payer, the two data sets could look just completely different. And so there's a lot of work that we need to do uh, to transform these raw landing data sets, which we've now loaded to Redshift, which is uh, just a database. And we want to map them to what we like to call internally a common data model or something that we use. Um, it's a common schema that we can use for all the data that we ingest. And it helps us apply analytics to a bunch of disparate data sources. So it takes a really long time um, to actually transform this raw, dirty data into something that we feel is comparable among every one of our partners. Uh, it takes you know, about a, a week to three weeks of mapping from you know, source columns to target columns and QC to make sure that there are no duplicates and you know, we're in like the proper normalized uh, data form and all sorts of stuff. Um, but that's, 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 a, that's a well worth process. It's, it's better to do that than to try to build custom analytics for every set of partners that we have. And so we build a set of analytics and we divorce that um, from the actual data that's coming in. We transform the data that's coming in into like whatever we want it to be. Um, we set a, a common data model. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of one of the biggest time sinks and also time savers. So it, it's a big investment, but it also uh, leads to what we can essentially, what we hope will eventually be like a research grade database. Um, and so, you know, one of the pain points there is, is keeping each partner in these logically separate databases. We have one for you know, Cigna or one for Humana or one for Optum, one for a bunch of different databases. Uh, we need to keep them separate from a compliance perspective, but that leads to these you know, other pieces of the database, such as code sets, you know, zip codes to uh, a bunch of census data that we've compiled or um, NDC codes, national drug class codes to, um, you know, to like therapeutic classes that we've built custom for our, for our own analytics. We have to keep those in sync across all these databases and that can get really annoying. Uh, so that's one pain point of, of you know, having to keep all these individual databases. And so one of the ways that we're thinking about potentially tagging like that in the future is can we use Redshift Spectrum or Databricks' Delta Lake, um, which are two kind of data warehouse, data lake sort of solutions to, where, to warehouse our data relationally within S3. Uh, are there any questions so far? Is everyone doing okay? Let's see some stuff in chat. All right, cool. What kinds of tools and languages do you use for the QC? So uh, this whole portion of ingest and loading and transformation into our common data model is all based in PostgreSQL uh, and Redshift. Cool. All right, so, so next up, so after we've ingested, after we loaded, one of the interesting paradigm shifts is, is how, how can we clean this data in a way that's fast, easy to use, 
Um, it doesn't take a ton of time. So we clean data for specific analytic use cases. So for sales, we have a different set of you know, ways to clean the data for predictive analytics, for health outcomes research. Um, and we use an analytics language that's translated to SQL instead of writing SQL directly. Um, and so on our, on our side, that's something called dbplyr, um, and it's within the, the tidyverse. Um, and on Python, that's something called SQL Alchemy. Um, and there are a lot of solutions like this, and they kind of help avoid the verbosity of trying to write a bunch of SQL queries to extract, to extract data directly. Um, in a given amount of time, they can do much more powerful and much more complex analytics because they're analytics languages, and it's, it's nice to be able to, to write something in one of those languages and then have it translated into native SQL rather than having to write you know, thousands of lines in SQL ourselves. Um, and so it's, it's, it's also much faster um, to, to work with huge data sets in a database rather than in local memory using R or Python. So, you know, one of the options we have is like, okay, everything is in Redshift. Can we just download all this data, save it on our data or save it on our hard drive and uh, use R or Python to clean that data locally. And uh, if you've ever tried to join tables in R or Python, or if you've ever tried to load data that's hundreds of gigabytes large, in, a, in like a single machine. Um, it's not a great experience. It takes really long. Um, and SQL is just so much faster for that side of things. Um, and so the key principle here is like, we only want to download data locally that we want to model or that we want to do actual analytics on. Otherwise we want to keep it somewhere where big data is more at home. So whether that's in a data lake, a data warehouse, a database or a cloud computing cluster, we want to try to push off as much of the data cleaning to these sorts of tools as possible um, in order to preserve you know, our sanity. And so just to give an example of what this dbplyr looks like. So this is an example of a function that takes in a, a member table, uh, does some transformations to it, um, and, and then you know, returns this cleaned data. I saw potentially another question. Have you tried Impala with Parquet data structures? I have not yet. Um, I have heard of Impala and Parquet. I haven't done any sort of research on them. So I, th I think one of the things in data science is, and data engineering and DevOps in general, is there's a million different tools. You can kind of choose the one, iterate on it for a while, and eventually you'll end up rewriting and moving to another, to another framework or another, um, you know, all that stuff. So uh, I'm sure we'll end up at one of these solutions at some point, but it's, it's constantly iterating and it's constantly um, developing. And so, so just to go back to this uh, cleaning example, this sort of thing in SQL is a lot less intuitive to, uh, to read, to write um, for a lot of data scientists and data analysts. And so um, it's something that can be functionalized, very easy to use um, and, and sets the stage for all of the predictive analytics uh, uses of this member table. This is like we import a member table, we clean it, um, and what pops out is something that has a member ID, uh, whether they're male or not, their zip code, and their birth year. And so after that data cleaning section, we get to outcome engineering. And it's not something that I had actually, I don't, I don't think it's a real term. We, we've really come up with this in, in, at Cricket Health. And so this is actually where the bulk of my time as a data scientist lies. I used to think you know, 80% of my time was spent on this data cleaning section. But the reality is much of that process is, is really outcome engineering or, or setting up a minimal data set with the outcome I actually want to predict or model or determine. Um, and that involves making a lot of decisions. That's where expert data scientists really add value. And so the whole idea of outcome engineering is like, what is the overall problem I'm trying to solve? So at Cricket Health, one of the first projects I worked on was, okay, there's a ton of undiagnosed folks who have chronic kidney disease, that's a problem. Um, what kind of outcome do we want to model? Binary or continuous? And so uh, the choice there is like, okay, do I want to say they have undiagnosed CKD or not? Um, or do I want to model maybe their kidney health um, as, a, as like a percentage? Do they have 100% of their kidney health remaining? Do they have 0%, do they have 10%, whatever? Um, and so we ended up going with continuous in that case. We wanted to know for all people, um, what proportion of their kidney health was remaining. And, and there's a lot of literature on, on equations to predict that using lab values. 
Um, and then at what cadence do I want to model that outcome? Do I want to, you know, predict it every month? Do I want to predict it once a year? Um, because there's actually a lot of variability in those lab values that generate your proportion of kidney health remaining. Uh, the decision we made there was, you know, we want to average over the course of an entire year, all these readings that you have, and then train on that for a calendar year. And so uh, just a quick example here. So we take in a labs data set, we filter all the labs to only the labs that are relevant to calculating someone's kidney health remaining. Um, we join it on a bunch of tables to bring in variables that are necessary in that equation. Um, we only want to look at people who are 18 years or older, um, et cetera. And then later on in the script, we can do different things with that. So linked labs was created earlier, and now, we've, now we're creating a different table based on all of that. And if you tried to do this all in SQL, it would literally take like hundreds of lines and it would not be as easy to read or as easy to understand. It would be far slower. Um, and so one of the reasons we went with DBFire is because of this insanely good, like concise representation of what we want. Um, it's, it's very quick, just as quick as native SQL. Um, and it's very, very like low maintenance. Um, yeah. Any questions thus far on that? Feel free to let me know. Okay. And so uh, after we've done this outcome engineering, we've come up with our model, our base data set. Uh, we have every row has an outcome. Um, and we want to start adding in information that we can actually use to predict uh, these outcomes. The, the key concept here is like, can we actually divorce every outcome we want to model from the features we're using to make a prediction? And so one of the driving factors there is it actually turns out the same variables I'm using to model someone's kidney health, whether they have 30% of their kidney health or 50 or 60%. Um, those same variables can be used to predict their income or their hospitalization risk or their mortality risk or really any number of, of things about them um, that we could intervene on and potentially, you know, cost savings, health uh, outcomes, make those things better for our, our customers. And so one of the questions there is like, what are all the individual pieces of information I can scrape from someone's claims history? And then can I divorce that from whatever outcomes I actually want to model? Um, and so the final data set generation process actually looks like we, we start ingesting that data, we load it all, all into S3 and Redshift, we then clean and filter the data to whatever standards we want. Um, that's using dbplyr. We create that wide model ready base data set with one outcome per row. Um, and then given that minimal set of columns, can we join in hundreds of predictor variables that we're working on in the background? We've got interns working on it. I'm working on it whenever any predictive modeling project that we've done, can we pull in all of these features that we've developed for every predictive modeling project we've done? So we start with a member ID outcome and outcome date. Um, and we say, what's well, all the information I can pull prior to that outcome for this person and train on it. We apply a feature engineering function that brings together those features. So uh, at this point, our predictive pipeline is around 200 variables. Um, and then we download, finally, that at the very end, we download the data uh, to either locally or to a cluster that we can actually do um, analytics on. And so, again, the key takeaway here is like get as much of the entire data cleaning, data set generation done in a database or a cluster using SQL, but without the constraints and the verbosity of having to use SQL as an analytics language. And then, so once we get we have a base data set. We have, every, we have a clean thing that we can model. Uh, we want to jump into model training. So as a data scientist, I spent weeks, months even, uh, doing data cleaning. But then I would spend an equal or greater amount of time training models. I would set them up on my computer, run it overnight. Um, and that was just an inefficient, very inefficient and computationally intensive process um, for me to just like have to wait on these models to complete. And so I think step one in these sorts of data science workflows always starts with like run on your local computer if you can. 
And I think if you have less than a million, maybe even less than 5 million rows uh, in, in a data set that you want to model, that's pretty reasonable to do for a lot of things. Um, you don't start to run into too many, too many, like, too many roadblocks. But then, then you hit a data set that's, that's much larger and everything goes to flames. So in step two, you, you, you know, once that's no longer viable, you start to use a computing server in the cloud to handle your compute needs. And that's kind of the thing that I had worked on and built um, as a student for the labs that I was working with. And we, we did that. It was, it was relatively cheap, relatively elastic. I was able to compute faster. I was able to run stuff overnight and not have my local computer uh, just be like basically on fire, too hot to do anything, whatever. Um, the disadvantages are if, if you're doing stuff for healthcare, there's a lot of considerations you have to make for HIPAA, especially at the academic setting at Berkeley. Um, and so we've solved for this at um, Research IT in Berkeley, but it's, it's a problem for a lot of different, um, for a lot of different labs uh, in general and for companies themselves as well. And then it's not automatically elastic. I actually have to change the size of the server. So uh, if, if I'm running something that's really big, um, it's going to have to tell me in some way, either by not completing or crashing my server, that my server is too small. And then I'm going to go have to shut down everything, resize it up. Um, and, and that's, you know, frankly, pretty annoying. Um, and then when it's done, I need to size it back down because otherwise it's incurring pretty large uh, costs. Um, and so it's not an ideal solution. Uh, and so what is the ideal solution? Um, the final frontier, I think, involves a distributed machine learning interface for you can use it on your own computer just as easily as you can use it on a server, uh, just as easily as you can use it on a cluster with uh, Spark and all this other stuff that's, that's just kind of being built in, in the background for, for big data. And I think that's really the, the key crux here is um, big data, nobody, nobody agrees on, on how big big data really is. And so coming up with solutions that work for everybody, um, that can auto scale, be cheaper and more performant at whatever scale um, you're working at is really the crux of it. And so uh, just really quickly, I'll jump into uh, a little demo of H2O, which is this sort of final frontier, a distributed machine learning interface that can, that can do you know, biostatistical modeling, that can do machine learning modeling. It's, it's a great system and I'll just show really quickly how it looks and works. Um, can you still see my screen? Can someone confirm that you can see like a R Studio or is yep. it? Okay, cool. Uh, so H2O uh, is, it's got a great GUI. Um, right now it's running on a server. We're probably, I've reached the point where I probably need to start moving to a cluster in this coming quarter with just how our data needs are. Um, and so we have our server, it's got, I think it's got 16 cores and uh, how much RAM it has. about 128 gigabytes of RAM, it's great. Um, and the modeling interface looks like this. We have an API in Python or R that looks very much like this. You set an X, you set a Y, you set an outcome weight, um, you set a training data set. And then I think most importantly, one of the cool things about HTO and AutoML in general is that you can set it to run for three minutes, 15 minutes, 10 hours, whatever. Um, and it allows you to quickly iterate using machine learning modeling. Um, whereas I think, when I first started, I was wasting a lot of time setting something, running overnight, coming back. Oh, it broke. Oh, it, you know, I actually want to add a bunch of different columns to it or whatever. Um, yeah, it really allows you to quickly iterate on um, your machine learning modeling uh, and generate stuff with kind of minimal uh, input from the, from the researcher. And then when you're finally done with the whole H2O AutoML phase, um, you can go and, and get into really deep, like machine learning, uh, that you've spent all of grad school, uh, you know, spending time on optimizing all this stuff, but that is kind of separate from how can we actually get to the best model possible, um, that's relatively performant, 
this can get about 90% of the performance of like the best model that I can generate uh, in three days or a month or whatever uh, in 15 minutes. So it's, it's very fast. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of the future. Like I said, it's that final frontier. It allows you to look at uh, stuff as it's going on, as it's being built. All these different models were built in, in probably the last 24 hours or so. Um, they're running in the background. If I want to click on a model, um, I can see what variables were very important, um, all that sorts of stuff. And then I can run performance metrics. I can save the models uh, and all that stuff. So it's kind of going to be a great solution to scale from the server into a cluster. It's distributed across multiple nodes, if there are any, or multiple CPUs, if you only have a, a laptop or, or a server. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited about where all this stuff is going. So I think that's pretty much it. Uh, if you're interested in building a server setup yourself, uh, I'll do a quick plug. Um, I, I do that stuff on the side. I, I consult to help build servers for like HIPAA compliant um, AWS setups and stuff. And it's, it's very easy to use, um, very easy to, very seamless. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think that's it. That's all I had. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to ping me. I'm pausing for questions. I had one question, which was, I just curious, um, this is Irene, how often would you go out and um, refresh and get a new data set since it takes uh, so long to, uh, to clean the raw data? Yeah, it's actually, um, that whole process is super messy unless you've done what I've realized needs to be done, which is divorce those two things have uh, you know, the whole data set generation piece. It actually runs in about 20, 30 minutes right now. Um, whereas I think in the past while doing it locally, um, it would take like days, literally run things and come and like my whole work day was like, I'm waiting for this. So I would have to figure out something else for me to do while I'm waiting for this to come back. Um, and so right now, if we want to add a variable, uh, it's probably 30 minutes turn around to get a new data set and then another 15 minutes to train a model on so that it's like it's like under an hour to add stuff or take away stuff um, which i think is just like 10x faster cool thanks uh, i have two questions let's take the first quantitative one how big is big how large are your data sets yeah, so uh, I think, so at one point, um, so to use this server, I would, I would say like local setups are great for up to at most 10 million rows. Server setups are great for up to 50 million rows. And then you really need to start looking into clusters. Otherwise you're having to spin up this like giant expensive server uh, every time you want to do any sort of modeling on like a, or data cleaning, um, on like a 50 million row data set, that's very large. So with a cluster, one of the great things about, um, clustering is auto scale. So you simply submit jobs to it, um, on Savio, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, you submit a job, it'll on AWS, it'll auto scale to whatever, uh, you need. And so. I honestly don't think there's an upper cap on how much data you can feed like an auto scaling cluster. Um, for Savio, I know we were doing like just generalized linear modeling on 50 million row data sets and it, it wouldn't run on Savio unless we had a big memory node and we just didn't have access to those because. We I see. So you, you measure in rows. Do you have a feel for that in bytes? Yeah. So it, it's, it depends because, uh, I think in that case, it was 10 gigabytes for 62 million rows. I think for the CKD like modeling I'm doing right now, uh, those are probably closer to 15, 20, 30 gigabytes. Uh, but one of the really big problems is trying to model on that actually consumes like three to a hundred times the amount of RAM you actually need to keep the base data set in there because the machine learning models need so much RAM. 
Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, the other question is that you mentioned that HIPAA co that one of the reasons you couldn't use AWS was HIPAA compliance. So what sort of storage guarantees would you need to be able to use a cloud-based solution? So or security guarantees, perhaps. Yeah, I would actually so HIPAA compliance, I actually think is easier in AWS than in, in many cases. Um, you need to like do a lot of legwork. You got to sign a BAA. Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of legwork, but it's a HIPAA compliant uh, interface. Um, and I think there's just, we had to do a lot of architecture work um, prior to me building out like all the server setup in, a, in an automated way. Uh, I, I don't think like anybody had really done that at our university. Um, and so there was a lot of time spent with research IT like architecting what a HIPAA compliant AWS infrastructure looks like. Um, and now that that's built, I actually think it's, it's relatively easy to use. Um, and yeah, it can be leveraged uh, in like a week to build you the same sort of setup that took literally like six to eight months uh, for the lab I was working for. Thank you very much. Any final questions? Cool. All right. Well, uh, my contact info is in this presentation. I will pass it on to whoever needs the presentation in case it's of interest. Thank you, Kunal. I will, uh, I'll get in touch on email to get a copy of the slides and we'll post them in the usual place and message out the meetup on